We're at the start of a new era in recording because you have a guy playing a bass guitar. It, it's not necessary that he plays the bass guitar. We can, we can basically, we can do anything with sound. You can do anything with sound? Yes, we can do anything with anything, sound. Any, we can do any, anything. We can do anything with sound. With sound. With sound. Trevor Horn is one of the world's most successful and innovative producers, sometimes referred to as the man who invented the 80s. In this part, we get some great stories from Trevor's past and hear about the kind of techniques he used on his innovative earlier recordings. I was really a bass player who sang a bit. And then I, you know, I joined Yes and, and you know, I, I had a hit as a singer, but they had to put my voice to a like it's made it sound like it came out of a radio speaker because it had no, you know, I've never had a voice that had even the vaguest amount of soul in it. <laughs> Trevor Horn started trying to do anything with sound in 1979 in the duo The Buggles, who gave Island Records their first ever number one with Video Killed the Radio Star. Later, Horn did something even more unexpected. He joined Yes, that supergroup from the 70s, as their singer, performing at vast venues like New York's Madison Square Gardens. Then came the move to record producer, and now there's ZTT, with Frankie Goes to Hollywood repeating the Buggles trick of an unknown band reaching number one. I've always worked the same way, really. It's just these days it's a lot quicker because, because of all of this stuff we have. When I started out, if you wanted a rhythm track, you had to play it. And, you know, I, I was uh, probably one of the first people, along with my friends, who started to do crazy daft things, you know, with, for rhythm tracks, you know, like bashing telephone directories. Back in, like, 78, I made myself a drum machine on a piece of two-inch tape in a studio I used to use. It cost me a couple of hundred pounds. I had to pay the drummer. And what it was, I got him to play a basic beat, but I split the drums up. You play four on the floor, and the snare drum on off beats, eight on the hi-hat, or pea soup. I had like two alternative hi-hats, a few crash cymbals, uh, and a drum fill every, every eight bars. And uh, what I used to do, when I had a demo to do, I'd speed it up or slow it down, depending on the tempo. And then, then I would run it off you know, muting the tracks and stuff, get myself an arrangement of what I needed and run it off onto a quarter inch tape and put it onto the master that I was then going to work on. You, you know, back then, you didn't go for, on a college course for record production. You had to figure it out and you had to get into a studio and studios cost like, cost 20 pounds an hour, 30 pounds an hour. They cost almost as much as they cost now, you know? And, and so the only way you could get into a studio was if somebody was paying for it um, or if you pay for it yourself. And I had sort of four years of working for song publishers, one in particular who gave me a lot of work. Whenever he signed an artist, he'd give me, you know, 300, 400 pounds to, to make a set of demos of their songs. And uh, that would get me into the studio. You know, and I'd think this time I'm going to try this, this time I'm going to try that, you know, whatever. By the time I wrote Video Kills the Radio Star, I'd been, me and Jeff had been doing, been doing it for like nearly five years. We'd made loads of, loads of stuff. And for publishers or whatever, you know, we'd, it's a, you know, we'd had a really good learning period. So we put, you know, we kind of put every trick we knew in the video killed the radio star and made it sort of jump out of the, off the tape, you know, but that's what you have to figure out. It takes you a while. I think I was the first producer to have a rig and um, my rig was a, a TR-808 with a set of uh, triggers on it that David, Dave Simmons had put on it for me, um, you know, like for each of the, each of the drums and uh, a set of Simmons modules, remember Simmons modules? And uh, a Roland uh, sequencer that had four banks and you just put lists of notes into the four banks, you know? You put like eight E's in bank number one. And a Minimoog, a uh, CV and gate linked to the sequencer. 
I used to trigger the sequencer from the um, 808, you know, and the Simmons drums. So it meant I could get a bass track. And that 808 was a bugger because when you put the song in, you basically had to let it run doing all of the changes and then kind of go, that's it. If, if you fucked up, you know, while you were running the song, doing the changes, you had to start again. And so, you know, for instance, on something like Poison Arrow, ABC, when I said to them, you know, if you want to make it better than this, this is how we do it. And I programmed the bass and the drums into my rig. I think it took me eight hours to do. Because don't forget, I did I do the bass as well. Dun, 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 dun. So, you know, I had to, that was a one set of notes in one of the, uh, you know, banks. And then the chorus was the next set of notes, you know, that, all that kind of stuff. Um, so, yeah, so, so I was the first, I had a kind of vision at the time, which was sort of Vince Hill meets Kraftwerk. I was, I thought I want to, I want to make electronic records that, that, that work in the mainstream because it's so, I, I find the idea of it so exciting. Um, you know, I, you know, we, I had the seventies and, and seen, you know, all that Elton John, Led Zeppelin, you know, all those, the big bands and the who, and it was very hard to compete with that. You know, you think at the end of the seventies, there was all of that stuff. So you're going to have to come up with something a bit fresh to kind of compete with it. So. So when I, yeah, I, I thought technology is the way because it's, uh, I find it the most interesting, the idea of being able to construct stuff. The more, the more control you could get in the studio, the better, you know? Yeah, I had a fair like, yeah, I had one of the first 10 that came into England. Of course, they cost 18 grand. I mean, there's just a lot of money you could buy a house for 18 grand back then. And, you know, it, it was, but it was a fabulous thing when it arrived, you know, in the flight case. And you get it out white. And the f I fired it up and I loaded up Orc Stab. <laughs> Woomph! God, it was amazing. I remember, I remember really. Uh, but then I figured, I mean, the manual was this thick. I, I'm never going to do that. I was, w w where I was clever was I gave it to J uh, JJ and Charlick. JJ, who had been Jeff's dancer's roadie, I gave it to him and I just paid him by the day when he came in the studio and he had it all the time. And I would throw stuff at him, like, I want to do the backing vocals in it. How can we do it, you know? And he was brilliant. He'd spend ages, you know, and come out and he'd have some new sounds in it. In, in, in the beginning of the 80s, people, people knew about sort of digital audio, but they didn't really understand how it worked and what it was capable of. And, you know, I, I got a digital multi track in, in 1983. I got one of the first ones and then I, you know, then I had two of them because once I had one, I, uh, I told them, you can't just let me have one. You've got to give me another one because they're too unstable. But once we had two of them, we could, for the first time ever, we could just do anything we wanted. Um, because Steve Lipson was, was, was brilliant, you know, brilliant engineer and a, and a lovely guy. And I remember coming in one day and he said, listen to this. And it was welcome to the pleasure dome. And I was like, what have you done? He said, I put the chorus over the verse. And I was like, how do you do that? And he was the offset, offset the two machines. I put this on that and that on there. So we can do additive multi-track editing. So that was it. We, we did what was a pleasure dome. That was like, you know, all done with two Sonys, you know, making it up as we went along. So that was a huge thing. And so I was, the, we were there ahead of, nobody really understood. Did Jill Steve was the first person to say, stop EQing to tape. Put the EQ on the monitors, record everything flat. That's the secret. None of that shit that you do for analog where you pump up the top end and compress the hell out of it. Because if you put it down on digital like that, it will forever sound like that. You know, so we used to, well, Steve used to leave everything uh, flat, 
we call it all flat and put the EQ on the monitors. Um, a lot of people really crashed and burned with early digital because of that. Um, but no, people just didn't know what the hell was going on for a few years. And like, they just didn't know what the hell we were doing. Now the world's changed, you know? And, uh, and you realize that now everything's a sample. But back there, the thing, back then, the thing that made those samples interesting was how, was how bizarre they sounded. You know, how they would romanticize the sound. Nowadays, it's, um, records are different. A lot of the time they sound really good. Um, people have learned a lot of lessons and there's a lot of great samples out there. There's a lot of great programs. Um, I don't hear so many records of people playing together that turn me on. Horn's new headquarters is just off the Portobello Road in London. Once a waxworks factory, the building was turned into recording studios by Island Records. Ireland let the Horns take over in return for releasing their ZTT label, on the understanding that this would be no ordinary record company. It's different because everything is run by a top record producer and just two others, and because that producer has decided to work not with the already rich and successful, but with unknown bands. The new acts that come along, the kids who have all the best ideas, very rarely get hold of a good producer, you know, because, because there aren't that many good producers around and the ones that are around are very expensive. And so I thought it would be really unusual to actually go back to produce people who, who were just, you know, completely making their, their bands. Yeah, making their first record in a way it was more exciting. By the time I got Sam West, I didn't have to worry about studio time. I was selling a lot of records and people were perfectly happy to pay for studio time for me. And also by the, by the beginning of the 80s, you know, you, you had the first things like TAC 4 tracks and stuff like that. And so I had a studio at home called Despair Studios and I would do all the programming in there, you know. And uh, by the time you're talking about um, uh, when I was doing ABC and, you know, I, it was after Malcolm McLaren and Yes that I got, you know, as I was doing Yes, which would have made it 83 that I sort of moved into Sam West. So I'd long since lost the fear of, you know, the number of hours. Uh, but we always charged by the day in Sam West because I always hated that by the hour thing. You just pay for the day and if it went till two o'clock in the morning, so what? Of course, some people tore the arse out of it. But other people, like George, my uncle, the Pet Shop Boys, would just stay for months, you know? And we never charged them overtime, you know? Trevor isn't all about the past, though. Not long ago, he opened Psalm Music Village in West London. Well, designing a studio for modern times, first off, it can't be too expensive. It still has to be in the right location. So there are nine small rooms, basically, and you can rent combinations of them. Um, one of them has a conventional board in it, uh, an SSL, and and uh, it's like a miniature, two of them um, like miniature Psalm control rooms done by Sam Toyoshima and John Flynn. So they're really perfect sounding rooms. And um, it's sort of modular. Uh, pe people go to these places like ours to be able to work undisturbed, play things back loud and uh, not have problems with the neighbors, you know, all that kind of stuff. We get people like, you know, the X Factor people who do all the music come in generally every year and work solidly through for a few weeks. It's, we have a lot of, you know, it's more of the kind of thing that people want. Uh, but the other thing that people want is, is for you to be in a place that's easy to get to as well, you know, like and we're in Ladwood Grove, which is a really nice part of town. People do things differently now. It took me a, it took me a little bit of time to understand because people book writing sessions. But a writing session is actually making a record a lot of the time. I didn't realize that because you don't write the song, make a demo and then give the demo to a producer who then rethinks it. I don't think that process happens so much these days. It seems to me you write the tune and there it is, if it's good, you know? because so much of the way people write these days seems to me they write over beats or programs or gags, you know? And that's fine, you know, if you can, I wouldn't like to have to do that all the time. 
Um, I think it's better if you write starting from a lyric because then a lyric will take you somewhere different to the necessary, you know, if you write music, you, if you write just backing tracks, you just end up writing eight bar phrases, four bar phrases and all that kind of stuff. But if you come up with an unusual lyric, you might do all kinds of strange things to, to accommodate the lyric. A lot of people have got misconceptions about what a record producer does. They think that the record producer works the desk or they think that he pushes faders and things like that. But in actual fact, the record, I mean, you can see all of this equipment. I, I don't uh, touch anything. Maybe I twiddle the occasional knob. In a way, I am the artist's uh, puppet because they come to me with their ideas and I use all of this and, and all of my experience to make whatever dreams they have or whatever ideas they have come true. When it comes to engineering and, and producing, I think in a lot of cases they're two different jobs. I could never have engineered as well as Gary Langan or Julian Mendelssohn, you know, the two original Sam engineers. They were both brilliant engineers. And, you know, Gary was like extraordinary at times. You know, Gary used to do stuff and I'd like, whoa, can we get away with that? I could never have done that and handled the band. You see, really, I mean, you know, I came to production as from really from being a songwriter, not from being a, but I'm still obsessive about studios and I know what's going on. And, you know, I could, uh, back in the day when it was just a 24 track on the board, I could comp vocals and do all that kind of stuff. I actually, I used to quite enjoy it, but, but it, it doesn't, you know, it's a different thing and rock bands, more often than not have a engineer producer. But I bet if you went in the studio, the engineer producer's got an engineer engineering for him. <laughs> you know what I mean? <laughs> because it's a different job. Let me give you an illustration of engineering session, right? Um, I, I had to record some vocals with Rod Stewart, right? And I had to um, talk him into singing at the computer. I say, Rob, we're coming by tonight and we're going to record you into a computer. And uh, he, oh, he was like, oh, I don't think so. You're not going to rock and roll in a computer. Computer's not fucking rock and roll. I said, don't worry, it'll, it'll be fine. Anyway, I showed up with the computer. You know, it was relative. I'm talking about 94, 95 or something. And, um, you know, in Rod's summer house and... We had a vocal booth set up and I worked the computer and we did this song and, and it worked better than Rod thought, even though I realized that I was going to have to buy a like 500 watt amplifier for the headphones next day. But at the end of the session, Rod said, well, it's all right with the, uh, with recording in the computer, but what I don't like is I don't like you working the computer. He said, because you are no fun. He said, normally you have a drink, you make jokes and you laugh. He said, but you were no fun tonight. So tomorrow you've got to get somebody to work the computer. If you enjoyed this video, be sure to like and share it and subscribe to the Sound on Sound YouTube channel. Also, check out part two for the owner of a lonely heart track breakdowns. Please.